our uh, today's host. Um, so Hannah is an enthusiastic business analyst with more than 10 years of experience working as a business analyst in delivery. She now contracts as a senior BA and normally do complicated, uh, complete, uh, complex projects and uh, remain endlessly enthusiastic about using business analysis to help solve, uh, to help solve tough problems. So um, come along to hear about what life is like for business analysts working in the agile delivery team and what makes delivery focused work different from the other BA work. She will share how she approaches her work, her 10 most important learnings from her time on the front line and answer will, will questions about life as an agile BI. So let's welcome Hannah. And now I'm handing over the talk to Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Well, hello and good evening. I will share my screen if this works. Um, it won't, that work? Yes. Okay, cool. It wouldn't be an online meeting without asking, can you guys hear me and see my screen? Um, okay, cool. So hi, everyone. Um, amazed that you turned up <laughs> to listen to me natter about business analysis. Um, but kia ora, I'm Hannah. I'm a senior contract business analyst. I'm currently contracted to ACC, though I have jumped around. Um, and I have tried really hard to stick um, in the delivery space. And so that's where my the vast majority of my experience is. I did, I think, one contract outside of a of a delivery space, and I was like, oh dear God, no, <laughs> and went straight back. Um and so first I kind of wanted to explain um like why I work in delivery. Because like some people kind of avoid it. I think that it's got like a bit of a bad rap because it's it's often crunchy, often is under lots of pressure. Um but I love it because it's it's where stuff gets real. And lots of BA work that we do outside of delivery is we're not really dealing with real things. We're kind of like, we get to make pretty documents or visuals or kind of like reports. And we're reporting on what's happening. We're not making new stuff or making changes to, to stuff. And so delivery is the only real place where things start getting really real um, and it's also where, in my experience, I found the smartest people. Um, so in tech, when big projects, you've got amazing architects, amazing ops people, and they blow your brain. And that I personally love because it's like, oh my God, I've got so much to learn from all these people that I'm interacting with. Um, and plus the pace is really fast, the work complicated, and every day is a bit of a juggle. And if you've got any part of you is a bit of an adrenaline drinky. Um, you won't get the kind of adrenaline you get when you're dealing with a production system and a prod issue plus some deadline that you will at the delivery end of the scale. Um, and so welcome for anyone to come along to the delivery end of the scale if that kind of sounds like something that is interesting um, because it's definitely where the fun is at, in my opinion. But before I jump into um, my like 10 things, which I'm going to bang through, I promise, um, I just wanted to set up some helpful con concepts. Like I see a lot of you in the chat have obviously worked in IT. So this is going to be like, you guys are going to be like, <laughs> move on. Um, but for, for, I just want to set up some con concepts um, so that when I use jargon and I will inevitably use jargon and I apologize for that in advance, I almost cannot tell which parts of my language is jargon anymore. Um, you can ask me what that means as we go and or at the end, if that's a helpful thing. But let's just set up some concepts. First up, when I use the term team, what I mean is a cross-functional team. In a delivery um, in delivery context, we basically, well, traditionally delivery was always done in um, sort of organized by function. So all the BAs, you're in a team with BAs and you all kind of work together. And all the devs kind of were in teams and they work together. Um, that's kind of like no longer what's happening at all ever. Um, very rare to find that kind of setup. Um, modern teams are usually cross-functional. And what that means is you've got um, people from different expertise, business analysts, developers, testers, product owners, all these different roles and expertise 
in one team delivering to one goal. And so when you're working in delivery, it's really common for you to be like the only business analyst surrounded by people from other disciplines. You're usually the only one. It's, it's actually quite rare to have more than one of you on a team. And on those teams, you usually have these kind of roles. And I'm just going to bang through them. Like all of these are things that I highly recommend you Google if you want to dig more into each of these. Um, but the most common ones are product owner. Um, that's the person who's repping the business, is making decisions about priority, what to do next. Um, yeah, making decisions, I kind of think of is the entire job remit. Um, they could also be called like business sponsor. There's, all of these have different names. Um, so if, if that's confusing, shout out. Developer, obviously the person who's actually cutting the code. Um, they're the people who get stuff to actually done, <laughs> um, despite what we like to think of what we're doing. Actually, developers are the people who are like implementing changes. Um, this is, by the way, assuming in kind of IT team, because when we mostly talk about delivery, you can't really take IT out of big system change anymore. They're so It's so baked in. Now, a tester is someone who verifies that what you're doing or the change you're making actually works as expected. Um, and a scrum master also could be called an agile coach is someone who's kind of managing the team process and events and ceremonies. Um, and then, of course, you or me, um, the business analyst, who's supporting like the definition of work and making sure we're building the right thing. Now, of course, those are just the most common roles that you'd find. Um, there's lots of times that you'd have heaps of different other roles on the team. Like you could have a process designer, data analysts, architects, um, change managers, subject matter experts, which we call SMEs. Um, like you set up a team to deliver what you're trying to do on a particular project. So it could be very different. Now, the most common team structure um, that I've seen is you have one product owner, a couple of devs, one tester, um, half a scrum master because they're supporting two teams and one business analyst. Like that's the most common setup for a team. So if someone, if you're like taking a job in a delivery team, you're most likely going to end up with something like that with maybe like a little bit of access to a, a UI UX designer on the side. Cool. And of course, I've littered the words like agile everywhere. <laughs> and I'd, I, I'm i not going to dig straight into like, because um, obviously agile coaches or scrum masters can talk, talk to that much better than I can. But I wanted to summarize what like to set the bar here of what we mean by agile for this talk. Um, so agile is a word we use to describe iterative approach to delivery. And by that, I mean, um, there's lots of variation here. Like it can actually mean sort of anything. Um, nowadays, over 90% of projects report that they are delivering in an agile way. And except they're all doing it differently. So there's lots of variation. However, um, what you do find is that there's like three common elements to, um, to any kind of agile project or agile delivery. The first is time box periods of work. Um, commonly called a sprint, or at least in the scrum context, it's called a sprint, you know, like one to two weeks where you kind of do work and then you're like, okay, cool. We've um, meant to be have delivered something in that time period. The two is incremental planning. And by that, I mean, at the end of the time box period of work, you pop up and go, okay, cool. What are we doing for the next two weeks or the next three months? And then you get to the end of the three months and go, okay, cool. What are we doing for the next three months? And so you plan out just what's in front of you and you're not trying to plan out, I know everything till the end of time. And lastly, you have these kind of inspect and adapt practices. Um, and by that, I mean, as you're going along, you are encouraged and almost like have to go like, cool, how did that go? What went well? What didn't go well? And how can we learn from that? They're usually called retrospectives. Now, when you like just are out there in the world, the most common version of Agile you'll find is Scrum. Um, and most most will do a combination of ad, like of Scrum um, with a little bit of Kanban. Highly recommend you do some Googling if you're interested in this area. It's a whole, it's a whole methodology. Um, but for us, all we need to know for this period for this chat is um time box period of works, incremental planning, inspect and adapt practices. Um, I did want to call out um, scaled agile 
as a concept as well. And that's when you not only have one team working towards a shared goal, it's when you have multiple teams all working in this way together on a shared goal. Um, and so when you're talking about a big project, um, you'll be working in a often a way that's scaled agile to some degree. Now, in New Zealand, if you're working in government, that's most likely going to be safe. Um, but there's lots of different variations from less to nexus, um, all with a, their own little variations and craziness. Again, you should get a Scrum Master to tell you about the, the variation that you can get within this area. Now, that's all I kind of wanted to cover is like the setup. Um, and I just want to bang on in. So I want to jump into the 10 best things I've learned. Um, but of course, if you know me in the real Z's, <laughs> you'll know that I love rules. So here's the rules for this game. Love questions. Um, any or questions, there's the Slido link that is apparently in the chat. Um, and I'll answer any questions at the end of the talk. Um, there's a QR code and a link and a code. Um, hopefully that all works together to make questions. And with that out of the way, these are the 10 things, hate surprises. I'll give you a second to read while I take a drink and then we'll jump in. Cool. Ready? I got a nod, so I'm going to roll with that one nod. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, and so I, I promise these won't be all as weird as this one. Um, the first one is possibly the most important, and I don't know whether you can do any of the other learnings without this one. So when you get to delivery and you're sitting in this team and you're the only BA, um, you are usually deeply confused, which is what's being represented here <laughs> with the confusion. Um, and part of your confusion is like about what's going on and how we're digging into stuff and everything's changing and it's really fast paced and it feels quite overwhelming. Except you're surrounded by a bunch of experts and they all know stuff, right? Like they're all bringing their knowledge to the table. And so it's really easy. And this is how I felt at the start to come in and then want knowledge too, to be like, okay, cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to chase knowledge so that I'm also bringing knowledge to the table. And then I can be as can like contribute, like you guys all can, because I can see you bringing your knowledge to the table. The learning that took me a surprisingly long time to, um, to uncover is that's the wrong approach and that I just need to embrace not knowing because I'm never going to know all the stuff of the experts around me. And in fact, not knowing is my superpower because it means that I can say, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Or, huh, what does that mean? And will that go with this other thing? And like, will that even work? Or like, you said a bunch of jargon. Can we all just sit down and agree what those words mean? So like the not knowing is actually a good thing because then we can dig into and we can solve it. And our ability to dig into that and not think that we know is actually the biggest superpower that us BAs can bring to the table. And the truth is it doesn't go away. I spent a significant chunk of today not knowing stuff and asking dumb questions to a bunch of people who were smarter than me who knew more stuff. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to stop. Number two is super related. So if you have to embrace not knowing stuff, once you've gone out and found out the stuff, so you've gone out there and you've um, you've got like, you've collected the information about an impact or you've dug into what's exactly required in this process or you've established all this data that's over in a thing. You're like, okay, cool. And you're bringing it back to your team. Um, a thing that can trip you up and has absolutely tripped me up and caused a bunch of pain for myself and my team is number two, don't talk for experts. And the emphasis is on four um, for a reason. And I've used like a kind of analogy of you're a journalist because I think it's a really helpful framing for when you're reporting information back. Because you're going out and um, like, like a journalist goes out and he talks to like a physicist, say, um, the journalist doesn't pretend that he now knows as much as the physicist. He's like, well, Dr. 
Frank said blah 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 um and then if you ask a, a question that wasn't covered you're like okay cool I'll have to go back and talk to Dr Frank because I'm not a physicist so I can't answer your question very similar thing can happen with us all the time like we go out we dig a bunch of information and we come back to our team and we kind of report on it and if we make the mistake of talking for the experts um we kind of we make the mistake of thinking that we genuinely understand all of the complexity of what's out there in a business process in a piece of tech um in a team or any of the like the politics that are happening out there which means that we can often if we think we know and we get more information we can think we know where the pattern it fits into the pattern um but that can often be a mistake um for me it's this talking for experts and thinking that I understood is resulted in me accidentally signing my team up for work that my team couldn't do because I thought that I understood what the impact was and I didn't. It's actually the most common um, outcome of that if you trip over it. Um, so my lesson is don't talk for experts um, and treat yourself like a journalist and bring the experts into the party if you need them to and be like, hey, John, tell us about this thing. Um, so that everyone can kind of hear the expert and dig into it as well. There's a reason why it's 2023 and still interviews is a really um, loved concept on like the internet to like interview an expert and for that to be something that people like watching. It's because you learn a lot from actually seeing people um, report on things. Cool. Um, I'm just going to keep on banging through apologies if this is like a ramble at you um number three is analysis is a collaborative activity um and by this i mean i think like we're often i mean potentially you guys are different i i didn't do like the um degree of business analysis that i can see in the chat that some of you guys have done but a lot of what I learned through short courses and and um, and more was about how I'm bringing critical thinking to solve a problem on my own, and I'm doing the analysis work. What I've learned or what I've seen is that there is a correlation, a positive correlation between the more involved my team is and experts are in my analysis and the quality of outcome for that analysis. So the earlier I bring them in, the better the outcomes. And in fact, it's not only just that, that the, the outcomes are better. It's that I had to do less boring handover as well. And so if you don't include your team, then you're having to do, you're setting yourself up for annoying documentation and detailed requirements and lots and lots of conversation to explain again the thing that they could just come along and have seen in the first instance. Um, and there's actually like some good scientific backing for this. Um, so there's lots of research around diverse perspectives and um, bringing people into the conversation means that your analysis is rigorous, even if it doesn't feel more rigorous. Now, there's a prerequisite to this, which is you have to feel comfortable sharing work in progress. And that is something that is, I personally find quite hard. Like I, a um, little bit of like, I want, perfectionist around my collateral so it's something that I personally battle with of being like okay I'm just going to do it I'm going to share this thing even though I know it's really ugly and I know that it's not there and I know that they're going to think um it's got heaps of work to do but once I've done that I can get feedback and I get insights from the peeps I'm working with in a way that you just I simply couldn't do on my own it would take me so much longer if I was just sitting in a room on my own um, so I highly recommend um, analysis, treating analysis as a collaborative activity using tools like given when then or whiteboarding or whatever your construct or whatever your chosen um, methods is, but inviting those people into the conversation. Cool. Number four is my most esoteric, I promise. which is that you only work with models. Um, and by this, I mean, we BAs, we, we work with requirements and user needs and options and a whole lot of things that is us just modeling reality in order to be able to have conversations about it. 
Now, I don't say that to dismiss BA work, modeling reality so you can talk about it, super, super, super valuable and also fun. But the trick is to realize that it is a model because then there's a couple of things that happen on the back of that. A, if you understand that what you're working with is a model, then you can work better to understand the underlying truth. And also you've got more flexibility with how you represent things. I see this a lot with um, with really junior BAs when they come on, they, they pick up like the user story format. And as long as they get their requirements to that format, they're like, okay, cool, I've done it, right? But actually really good BA work or ability to like do really quality work is digging kind of beyond that um, and being able to get to the actual need that you can then, you could put it into a use case diagram, you could translate it out to a decision tree, you could you can capture it in a user story. The model is just the model. That's just the format that we're using for documentation or the method we're using to kind of dig into stuff so that we can get everything out. By, by realizing that we're only working with models, we have way more freedom to mess around with them and to be like translate between models or use different models for different stakeholders. <clears throat> um, and so like, yeah, I think basically I found that models work differently in different um, environments. It's well worth um, playing around with different models to try to get to the truth. Um, but always realize that it's a model and it's not actual reality and it's not reality until um, the developers have cut the code and it's out in production and users are actually using it um, because that kind of frees you up to be what we're actually dealing with is we're dealing with models and it's funner. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I'll say on that is I, I used a cube there with a use case a decision tree and a user story. And once I realized I was only dealing with models, I realized that I could just use them in different settings. So I'd often use those kind of, you know, use case decision tree and user stories, so common. But I would use them all on the same project, all representing the same truth, but for different stakeholders, depending on what they needed. Like decision trees, devs like it because it translates quite well to how code can be structured. Um, user stories, there's a lot of POs, love the user stories. Use case, different application again, much higher up, further up the business tree. Yeah, models. I promise I will go less esoteric. Um, cool, number five, getting to halfway. There is no one right way. Now, this is harking back to when I talked about um, Agile at the start. If I could put something on a billboard and make every single Scrum Master, Agile Coach, Project Manager, Program Manager, or Business Stakeholder read it, this is the one that I would put on there. Because everyone, like you'll spend your life people telling you that, oh no, this is how you do Scrum. Oh no, this is Agile. Or no, we absolutely need this project plan. Or no, this is how you do a business case. The truth is they're all right in their own context and a lot of the time it's it's like they can all be wrong in different contexts and some other organizations doing it slightly different it's fine and other organizations doing a bit of this and a bit of that and it's also fine anyone who tells you that there is one right way is blatantly lying to you or, or has only ever worked in one little box um and so what we can learn from that or what we can take from that is that in any new environment you go into, assume that they're doing their own version of crazy. And I can guarantee you that they are. They'll be doing some version of Agile that makes no sense to other people. They'll be doing some weird project planning thing. They'll have some weird budgeting thing. And so what you should do is, hi, how does it work here? And how do you do your backlog? And what's in it? And how do you structure your requirements? And how do you engage with your stakeholders? And how does planning work? Because if someone says, oh, we're just doing sprint planning, that could be anything from a day-long meeting off-site through to a one-hour regroup across the thing that you've already planned. Um, so just ask what they're doing because it'll be different <laughs> than the last place you were at and it will be different at the next place. And the more kind of flexible you are around how you're approaching work, um, the better off you'll be. Cool. Um, number six 
is understand the big picture, but move small pieces. Now, most work that we're doing nowadays, like it's really, it feels quite uncommon to have really small projects, like small enough to fit in your brain. Um, which is of course what I tried to do when I started out as a VA. I was working on this big system and it was a point of pride that I understood all of the requirements in the backlog, um, like literally all of them. And it was like an old system. So there was a lot of them. The spec doc was like this thick, it was insane. Um, what I, obviously I failed. <laughs> like I'll, we're human. There's only so much you can fit in there. There's so many, so much you can transact. It's like a computer. There's only so many Chrome tabs you can have open at any one time. But that creates a problem and the bigger your project gets, the bigger a problem it becomes because if you can't focus down into the detail, because that's actually your job is to dig right down to data, to transactions, to like user flows, to all of the detail that's down there. But so you need to be able to focus down there, but you also need to make sure that it's fitting together. And so this is the only pattern that I have ever seen work is what works for me. Um, and that is that you define the big picture, but at a shallow state. So really, really shallow, but you know the whole, like say it's a website selling pottery. I don't know why that's my example, but I'm rolling with it um, for the purposes of this. You decompose it. And so for our pottery selling website, um, that could be like a landing page, contact form, gallery, shop, um, maybe like an account preferences, um, somewhere to store your credit card, et cetera. And then once you've decomposed it, you know the chunks, um, you can identify the bit that you can work on. And usually that should be the hardest thing. The thing that's the highest risk is the thing that you should do first. And so for a shop that sells pottery, probably the gallery or the shop is the hardest. Maybe some of like the auth around user flows to get them transact out, assuming you're not using like an out of the box thing. But that's the chunk you can take. And then that's the one you can break down and you can work on. And of course, this is fractural, right? You could use the same pattern at each level. But the reason this is so important is because, well, A, they could descope any of the big chunks. So they could be like, don't need the gallery, just need the shop. Or who cares about having them log in? They can just go off to a shop and pay and we don't care. Like, so any of those pieces could change and move and you need to be able to talk about those pieces because that's the pieces that the business is going to care about. But it also means that you know how it fits in. You know how your bit fits into the hole. And so you won't get tripped up later with, oh, wait, if this is here, then this needs to work with this other thing. And then now we've got an integration issue. Um, and so this is less of a learning and more like, this is the only pattern that I have found. And this is how I'd recommend you do work. <laughs> um, it's how I work when I'm breaking something down. Define that, decompose it, pick the hard thing, and then focus on that thing. Repeat until all of the things are done. Cool, seven, um, the most on the nose illustration in the set. Um, seven, politics beats right every time. Now, this was the most depressing learning in the set. <laughs> it's because um, potentially a little bit of an idealist where I wanted like to make the best change and do the right thing for the org. And I think if you've if you've worked at all, I think it's really common to have that experience where you have a situation, there's some options, you're doing the analysis on the options and um, and there's an obvious right one. And that's the one that everyone knows you should do, but it's not politically, um, it's not politically acceptable at that point in time. So it's not chosen. So some weird tactical, um, weird, weird tactical solution comes in. And then you're like implementing a thing that you know that it's going to cost just as much as the real option in the end. And it's all very depressing. The lesson I want you to take from this is not that politics beats right every time. The lesson I want you to take is if politics is a tank, don't take a handheld gun or a knife, get an F-16. So always be aware of the politics around your project because that's the thing that's gonna kill you. Probably more than tech because everything is possible in tech. The thing that's gonna kill you is that 2IC is 
is going to push back because it's got the biggest changes to his department or that guy's worried about his budget or this guy's worried about his ego or this other guy's worried about his legacy um and guy slash girl I shouldn't have gendered all of the people in business um and then made them sound like they were going to kill the project but so the 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 learning is if politics is a tank which it is learn what's happening in the org and then fight like choose your battles to make things more palatable in the environment because winning isn't about being like right or this was the right option or being able to say later like told you so winning is actually making change in that organization towards the better goal and if that involves making sure that you've knocked down the politics um or at least address them so that you've got that kind of um consensus to move forward with an option um that's absolutely what you should do and that's actually the only way you can make real changes to build alignment within the organization itself but never forget politics because it's a tank and it will kill you if you're not paying attention very related is number eight um which is that presentation and messaging you can see how that ties to the one pre previous matters a lot and of course i did the on the nose thing where the things on the left are not prioritized or ordered or have any hierarchy and the things on the right have this lovely hierarchy um and so of course it's obvious right like the one on the right is easier to engage with it's easier to um to understand what the most important thing in because it's screaming at you that this is the most important thing and i think this is actually where i'd say like you know the people that you're interacting with out there in the world are usually just like really busy <laughs> and stressed and they have lives and kids and laundry and mortgages and also their team and potentially their like staff is like under pressure like there's lots of things going on and the more you can do to make it easy for people to engage with what your information is that you're trying to table, um, the more success you'll have. Um, and I also just want to be like, don't underestimate the value of a pretty document because people just like engaging with pretty things more than a really long, ugly document. Don't use Comic Sans. <laughs> um, but also it's more than just presentation right like messaging is more important than i think we often give it credit for we we deal with so much information all the time we're writing stuff down we're like we're compiling options and i think we often like number seven like the politics is there we should also align our messaging or be careful with how we're presenting information to make sure that it's landing in the right way with the audience that we're trying to land with um yeah, think of it like we we talk a lot about, um, you know, being customer centric. Well, our customers are our developers, our testers, and our business people that we're interacting with, and we should treat them like that. Like, how do they like interacting, and what how what's the best way for me to give this over to them? Yeah, cool. We're getting through them. Number nine is <laughs> potentially my favorite. Number nine is make friends with a dark cloud. And I'll explain because I'm pretty sure it's not um, evident. So there's always a person, right? Like they're on a project and they're like, this is going to fail. Um, or the other person in the back of the room is like, yeah, well, they haven't taken into account this other thing and that's inevitably going to kill them. Or the other person who's like, there's all these risks, this isn't going to work, this process isn't going to work, this sucks, the design sucks, everything's terrible. Now, that person um, is interesting. And they're interesting for a couple of different reasons. The first is, um, and of course, I'm discounting the toxic work environment state, which is, I've also had experience with, but we're not count talking about those. In normal society, particularly in New Zealand, we're quite polite. So we actually don't put up with the grumpy negative person who's like saying negative things about a project unless they're valuable and they're only usually valuable if they know stuff and so if you've got a person who's in a room being a grump they are someone you want to know and this is possibly my best pro tip in this entire set is they know stuff so what you want to do is after the meeting be like hi sup 
So you see some interesting things. Um, I also don't want this to fail or for your team to hate this or for that integration thing or for that like risk to eventuate. Can we talk about that? And can we get those written down and surfaced up so that we can potentially start mitigating some of the risks you're seeing? Because I can almost guarantee that that person knows stuff that is going to impact your project, but it, it the reason they're grumpy is because they're not being listened to or their risks actually being addressed. Um, and the, the thing that I definitely want you to take away is that that person who's being grumpy, um, it's not that they're being grumpy or being negative because they don't care, because people who don't care will typically say one time that it's going to fail and then sit back at the end of the room, not say anything until the end of the project when it does fail and then be like, I was right. So the, the person who cares is the person who keeps on talking, right? Is the person who keeps on grumping, is the person who keeps on trying to insert themselves. And so the best thing you can do is just lean into the grump and be like, hi, um, because they will unserve stuff. I frequently get credit for like, oh, well, it was really good that you uncovered that. I'm like, didn't, just went and talked to that dude um, or lady. My last dark cloud that I made friends with was um, a dude. Also, they're often the most interesting people in the project. So yeah, make friends with the dark cloud. Highly recommend it. Super uncomfortable. I hate conflict. You just got to lean into it. And if you can do it, or you can find someone who can do that on your behalf, you'll get a level of information flow um, and particularly around assumptions and risk to a project or a delivery um, that if you don't listen to, will kick you later. Cool. Um, super <laughs> went dramatic with this one. Um, but my last and um, last learning is number 10, you serve the team, not the BA gods. And by this, I mean, you're working on delivery and you're working in a team. And I know when I started, I I really wanted to do a good job. Like, boy, did I have a chip on my shoulder that I wanted to prove myself. And so I wanted all of my user stories to be perfect and I using the right tone and all structured the right way using, you know, like everything I wanted my BA work to be the shiniest gold standard I could possibly make it um, in often late hours I would spend doing the spit and polish required to meet this kind of like standard. Um, what I learned <laughs> is that that doesn't matter at all. Um, so the times when I have worked on a team that have produced the best thing in the shortest time frame for the most value for the customer or the business was frequently when we were running um, absolutely like lean and mean. And it wasn't my gold standard requirements. It was a post-it note conversation between me, the dev, the tester, the business owner, and then a phone call up to like get approval to go. Um, the worst analysis work in terms of like a gold standard of like process and everything being pretty and all like the formatting was often nowhere near me doing good value work and I don't think I can drum this in enough like like it's the team is the thing that realizes um value it's not a BA on their own BA on their own produces great documentation awesome awesome great great human but it's only through a team or through other things that value is realized for both the customer and the business. Um, I think, yeah, I don't want to belabor the point <laughs> there, um, but it's the one I'm most passionate about because I think that that's what um, holds us back for a team realizing um, BA value and teams often can see like, oh, why do you want a, a BA on your on the agile team? Well, we're actually this really awesome facilitator of information flow, facilitator of getting stuff done or finding the right thing to do. Um, but only when we serve them, not our own things. And that's the 10. Um, so I wanted to like at the end of this take like a, so what does this all mean? Um, and in sum, I wanna say like delivery is super, super fun and really awesome and the best place to work, blatant Hannah opinion. Um, as long as you like focus on the team and basically a lot of those lessons are if you dig one level down they're actually just don't bring your ego to the table because it will get very bruised <laughs> it's not the environment where you can be quite protected from the rough and tumble of like feedback and collaboration and dealing with all of the information coming at you and trying to get stuff done in the environment 
And also it's really important to inspect and adapt your own work to work out like what's working for my team and my PO and my business and how do I move that forward. Um, and it's also really important that you take an adaptive approach. So you're like not only like you're inspecting and adapting your own work, but you're adapting your entire approach to how you're doing your job. And so I wanted to share um, my approach to um, business analysis in a delivery context. Now, this is all very like loopy and fun. Um, it's a Hannah diagram after all. But you can see at the bottom there you've got like problem through understanding to decision to outcome. And you've got analyze, which is the thing that I, I don't think I need to explain to anyone on this call why analyze is important. But what I've, my instinct after analyze is actually to jump to do. And I think there's a lot of our instinct is to be like, okay, cool, we know, let's move. And what we miss and what a lot of the threads of my learnings have been is that people are the most important part to this. So you need to connect, you need to bring people on the journey and put people at the heart of how you're doing work in an agile way, because it's through people that you realize value. It's through people that you build alignment and get that decision made. It's through people that you uncover politics or uncover that information out there in order to, be able to make meaningful change, not just something transactionary or kind of um, service level. And so by like separating out and that's like deliberately separated out, analyze and do by putting people in the center, you actually, you get much higher value from the work you're doing. It's also a really important touch point thing. I found out this information, so I now understand something, but I'm going to take it to the crew and together we'll make a decision about how to move forward and what's next. I just did a horrible job of explaining that, but I've done a better job on my website, which is the link down the bottom. And I did write an article about this because I've basically been spending a lot of time thinking about approach over the last um, little while. So read that. I could talk endlessly about that. So I won't. And I will wrap it up with, I hope you didn't mind me nattering. Um, I'd love to connect um, on LinkedIn and I'm one of those people who post on LinkedIn, much to my own amusement because it, it kind of cracks me up, but it's also been really helpfully challenging to my own practice. Um, I've got a website, which I, I contract under the, um, the name Jimmy Consulting. So it's jimmyco.io and on there is like big A thinking methods um, and more. And if you're interested, I, I write one long form article each month, which I post out with a newsletter and you can sign up for that on my LinkedIn profile and my website. Yeah. And that is the end of my nattering. So I'm going to hand back to Melody, I believe. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, you are not nettering. Well, I, I believe everybody just enjoy your nettering. Yeah, I, I, I personally learned a lot because I sometimes um, feel like uh, working in the ID industry, a bunch of people must be really, really smart. And uh, I feel like um, uh, if I ask silly question, then um, I'm so scared to ask questions, but after today's talk, I think um, the people, the business analysts in different backgrounds, in different industry, we're just human beings. We ask people. The reason, uh, the only reason we, we ask the question, then we can move. We can um, making progress. This is, I think, this is my best takeaway, and I also quite enjoy your. Um, other approach uh, and your approach as well. Okay, so um, we are going to um, check um, everybody's um, who put the good question on um, use Slido. And we will have a look and uh, we can start from there. Yeah, I think um, everybody can see my screen, right? Okay, so yeah. I'm just read out. Yeah, I'm just read out the first question. Yeah, cool. Um, how do you know what are the right questions to ask in your effort to embrace not knowing stuff? 
oh my god it's like a redonkulously hard question I don't know whether I've ever thought about it um I just like I I think there's like there's a trick to embrace not knowing stuff where you don't you don't need to know everything like there's lots of stuff that you don't need to know yet so it's kind of being like conscious of um what's the critical thing right now that I need to know to keep moving um and being aware when you've got enough information so you don't want to waste their time with establishing everything because like your job isn't to know their job your job is to know enough to keep the team or the project moving which is that that different levels of knowing right um Honestly, I just ask everything that comes to my brain until I feel satisfied. And it's a little bit of art, a little bit of science. And I think never feel afraid to go like, cool, I think I have enough now. I'll be in touch and maybe I'll have more questions later um, and just looping back. And that being totally fine. In fact, um, being the reason I'm being hesitant is because there is lots of times when you can take up too much of your subject matter experts time, both in your team like, because anytime you take your dev away from cutting code, you're, it's a different kind of value, but you need to be careful with how much you're spending on that. So keep asking questions, but do take breaks and then loop back if you need to know more, is what I would suggest. I don't know whether that's an answer. Awesome. I think that sometimes I use this approach as well to, um, to do the icebreak, uh, to engage the people who I really don't know. So I think this is also my approach as well. I, I quite enjoy that, quite enjoy doing that. Cool. Um, let's see the next question. So uh, what are special skills or mindsets should a delivery BA have compared with those working more in the um, discovery and the planning space? Um, I think growth mindset, like the ability to deal with being kind of if, like almost the dumb person in every conversation <laughs> like just has to take a kind of resilience um but also um I know when I've done a bunch of personality tests like I know that I get really excited by a team succeeding it's less about like um like like that I find deeply satisfying like we got a thick we got a hot fix on prod in my team out to prod today and I was like um, and so if you don't get satisfaction from that, you probably won't enjoy that because your role is kind of, um, it's not as prominent. Um, and so if the idea of like writing post-it notes with um, an architect is exciting, then you should be in the space. If that does not excite you, then you probably shouldn't. That's not to like put down the other thing because I like without people around me, I, I wouldn't enjoy work. And so I wouldn't get half as much done as I do when I'm working with other people. And so it's kind of like, it's different. It's a different fit for a different personality or like what you enjoy doing. Cool. Again, yeah. I'm not sure I answered that. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe, yeah, the, um, the person who asked this question got inspired. Okay, cool. Let's move to the next one. And can you share more practices of uh, don't talk for the experts? You gave one example for inviting experts to talk more. I've been curious about other approaches. I think, thanks. Um, yeah, sometimes I've actually found a lot of success with, it's not necessarily making the experts do the talking, um, but even like, inviting them along to see you talk so that they can at least correct you when you're reporting back um and it also there's like two benefits to that right like a they can see what you're saying and they can be like like usually quietly afterwards okay so I want you to correct you on this point and you'd be like okay cool I'll correct it um but also they can kind of see how your team operates and then gets a lot more buy-in to what's happening in your space which will then make them more encouraged to share back later so actually just like literally letting them come along to like ceremony stand-ups, like, like involve them in your team practice um, is definitely another way to make sure that you're not talking for them. But it's also just like, um, I guess like highlighting them more. So I go out of my way um, to be like, yeah, I really want to thank blah, blah, blah for sharing X, Y, Z with me. They were really helpful. Um, 
because just the like the act of of reporting on them that they're the experts um inside your like your reports or maybe you're like doing a confluence page with a bunch of requirements making sure that you've like i spoke to blah 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 about this and this is how i got the information what you're actually saying is that everything that comes after that has a source that isn't just you um it's basically more about like never presenting yourself that you're the face of the expertise and um because it doesn't it doesn't undercut the value that you have added by compiling the requirements or compiling that information from that expert um by like highlighting them yeah so i'd say inviting them into your stuff um so your team actions um just as essentially like effectively quoting them and being like over there and then highlighting them as then like a source and being like quite careful about the source for this was blah 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 as opposed to here's my document aren't i great um if that makes sense. Cool. So if um, you want to ask more questions, please stay connected with Anna and add her on LinkedIn. I'm sure she will answer your question if you want to yeah, have more. Okay, <laughs> let's move to next question. So what is usually a business analyst role in the IGEL team? Depends on the team, um, but common threads would be your job is to make sure that the work items or the tickets or whatever um, conceptualization of work is happening in your team um, is like refined. And by refined, I mean um, that all the information is there, that the information is complete and actionable and all of the dependencies for that information have been highlighted and or addressed in some way. So for example, um, I'm going to go back to the website for selling pottery. Um, like say I was doing a contact form and I was writing up a ticket for that. My job would be to make sure that that had everything that was required for the business processes behind it for the dev to dev. It would have any designs that are required, any wording that was on it, and that maybe I'd raise a dependency if there was another dependency on another team to do a part of that. Um, and so like kind of refinement of work is like a key part of what you're doing. You're usually also alongside that doing some kind of um, discovery work. So you're doing run ahead work on like an idea. So you'd have like a business person come along and be like, we could do this X, Y, Z. Like say the pottery guy is like, what we could do <laughs> is have the ability to make people design their own custom pots. Um, and you're like, great, awesome. To do that, you need, and you'd be digging through working with people to understand what does that actually mean and what are the options there and what is the actual business requirement is that you're trying to build into a new market space is it that you're trying to build brand like what is the thing you're trying to achieve and then what are the options to try to achieve that um and then there's this kind of like at the um real functional end as things are getting developed you're working you're doing a lot of service work you're like cool do you have everything you need what's being uncovered because no matter how smart you are you will find stuff when it hits um, the real <laughs> and your job is to like then support that to be resolved or the best options. But then you're kind of like working with your product owner to say, cool, we could do this or this or this. Um, here is the downsides to a couple of them. What do you want to do with um, it? But different teams would need different stuff. Um, but that's broad, broad strokes, um, strokes kind of what you're doing on a day to day. And what you can kind of be expecting to do. Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing those general, I would say general trick, how to, yeah. yeah Very you. general. <laughs> <laughs> but it's helpful, really helpful. Okay, so our next question is, as mentioned, uh, analysis is a collaborative process. What is your favorite aha moment? in this process that helped to change the outcome on a project? Oh man, there's so many. Um, so many. How to choose an aha moment. Like, I feel like I get aha moments all the time. Like that's what I'm chasing. I feel like I'm chasing that on a day. Like literally a week ago, I had an aha moment because we'd done all this planning for some work. And it, it turned out that my um, technical team and the business side 
we were operating under two different assumptions around how to release a particular functionality. I thought it was one release with the, all the table work required for that. And um, the technical teams were like, um, like, <laughs> no, there needs to be two. And so we were just talking at cross purposes. We'd be talking at cross purposes for three months until we had this meeting. I was like, oh, you need there to be two. Um, and that's like happens all the time. Like that's the whole job is to hunt out the ahas where something is going on that doesn't quite make sense. You need to get it to the surface. Um, but probably on the biggest one would be like we were kind of building a massive project and what I hadn't realized or we hadn't collectively realized was um, how important or that migration was the biggest blocker to like literally everything. Like that migration should have been front and center. It didn't, it, it almost didn't matter what we built or how we built it or how we tackled it. If we didn't solve migration, migration was going to impact all of that. Um, so like data migration from a previous system to the new system. And that, that was the big bad in the room. And we had spent um, six months looking at the easy things and wasted time not looking at the hard thing. And that, quite fundamentally changed um how what we did next okay yeah thank you for sharing so we still have um three questions but we kind of approach to our time limitation do you want to like answer one and uh, maybe the rest of two um if you ask this question um you can connect with link uh connect with uh Hannah on LinkedIn, and she probably can um, answer your question. So I can um, probably just bang through them, like Prince2 oh, course, okay. so I can work with project managers better because project managers control your life on a project so that if you can talk their language, you get more stuff done. And it's already helped me like immensely because I can be yeah. like, oh, what you mean is this thing and I can give it to you. Um, cool. Like there is no one right way to balance stuff which is why like my approach is loopy and I just try to like to feel my way through where I need to be at any point in time. Um, oh no, there's way more questions. I can't answer them. I thought there were three. I thought you said three. Oh, I thought it was only three too. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Um, but happy to stick around. I'll follow your instructions. It's your show, Melody. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think we, um, like like me, I believe all of us quite enjoy Hannah's talk today. And if you pop your question here, but um, hasn't been answered by Hannah, so please stay connected with her, uh, add her on LinkedIn and just flick her a message. You see, uh, she's awesome. I think she definitely <laughs> love to um, engage with you. And uh, if uh, she can spy you, this is um, the purpose of our BA uh, career meetup. Um, you know, this is a meaning. We want to connect people. We want to help people. We want to trans help the people who want to transit um, uh, business as a business uh, analysts. Okay, thank you for Hannah. Really appreciate your time and everybody um, show up today. And we will upload recording to our YouTube channel soon. Um, and uh, please uh, feel free to su subscribe. We have um, uh, we have saved all the historic recording there. And if you like our events, please uh, refer our meetup group to your friends and colleagues, please. And you were able to find those link at the comment area. And uh, thank you for all your participation. Uh, we will have our next event. And the topic is interview preparation and uh, interview preparation and interview skills. Um, our speaker is Rihanna Bond, and she already delivered uh, one uh, event uh, with us. So please uh, uh, connect with us, and uh, you will get the most um, uh, updated information and uh, events from us. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Please stay um, connect and take care. We will see you next event.